If you recall, we have learned that for a member along its centroidal axis, there are a maximum of six internal reaction components: one normal force, one torsional moment, two bending moments, and two shear forces. And we already learned also that normal force and bending moment will cause normal stress, and torsional moment and shear force will cause shear stress. Here, I intentionally wrote these equations in this form to indicate the similarities in these equations. The stress is caused by the numerator, which is the driving force, over the denominator, which is a combination of some geometric properties. In this video, we will learn how to determine the state of stress of an arbitrary particle at this cross section, as caused by the combination of these internal reactions. You can also consider this video as a summary of what we have learned so far. First, for the normal force, we assume that the stress caused by the normal force follows a uniform distribution. Therefore, for any arbitrary point on this cross section, the normal stress sigma n is always determined through this equation, with a being the total cross sectional area of this cross section. Next, the torsional moment. We learned that the shear stress caused by the torsional moment follows a linear distribution, changing radially from zero at the center to the maximum at the edge. For an arbitrary location, its shear stress is calculated by the torsion formula, rho being its radial distance from the center, and this shear stress can be resolved into components along the centroidal axis. Next, for the bending moment mx about the x-axis, the normal stress caused by the bending moment follows a linear distribution, changing from zero at the x-axis to maximum at the location that is furthest away from the centroidal axis. And for an arbitrary point on this cross section, its normal stress is determined through the flexure formula. Here, Ix is the moment of inertia of the area with respect to the x-axis, and Z is the perpendicular distance from this point to the x-axis. For bending moment Mz about the z-axis, similarly, it also creates a linear normal stress distribution changing from zero at the centroidal axis, the z-axis, to maximum, again, at a location that is furthest away from the z-axis. And again, for an arbitrary location, its normal stress caused by this bending moment mz is calculated by the Fletcher formula. In this case, iz is the moment of inertia of this area with respect to the z-axis instead and x is the perpendicular distance from this location to the z-axis. Next, for the shear force vx along the x-direction, the shear stress distribution is not linear, with a maximum shear stress occurring along the centroidal z-axis and zero shear stress at the edges furthest away from the z-axis. At an arbitrary location, the shear stress is calculated through the shear formula. Here, Qz is the static moment of the area about the z-axis, Iz is the area moment of inertia about the z-axis, and T is the thickness of the member at this location. For shear force Vz along the z-axis, similarly, it also creates a non-linear distribution of shear stress in the direction along the z-axis. Again, the maximum shear stress occurs at the centroidal x-axis, and it is zero at the two edges furthest away from the x-axis. For an arbitrary location, the shear stress is determined again through the shear formula, but in this case, both q and i are calculated with respect to the x-axis. After you have evaluated the stress caused by the six different internal reactions individually,
you can combine the stress components along the same direction. You can also represent the state of stress on a volume element. Don't forget, the normal stress must be in equilibrium, and there's also the complementary property of shear stress. Let's look at this example. For this composite beam, which is fixed supported at point A, and it is subjected to the loadings as shown, we need to determine the state of stress at point C and also show the result on a planar element at point C. So according to what we learned, the first thing we want to do is to draw the free body diagram of this member and solve for all unknown external support reactions. So in this case, we remove the support at point A and add our unknown support reactions because this is a fixed support. We have overall six unknowns, three force reactions and three moment reactions. And through equilibrium, we can solve for all six of them. And then the next step is to apply the method of section, section this member at point C and solve for all the internal reactions at point C. And now this member has been sectioned at point C and we have chosen the left hand side for our analysis. We draw our internal reactions, all six of them, and through equilibrium again, we can solve for all six internal reactions. After you have become very familiar and comfortable with the concept and procedure in terms of how to determine internal reactions, there is an alternative way for an easier analysis that combines the previous two steps, which is at point C, we're going to try to replace these external loadings that we're going to chop off. Remember, you not only need to replace the forces, but also you need to replace the moments these external loadings create about point C. And as you can see, these numbers are the same as determined through the previous two steps. Either way, we have got to this point that we have determined all six internal reactions and we marked their magnitudes and directions at this cross section that passes through point C. And now we're ready to determine the stresses of point C as caused by these six internal reactions. We start with the normal force, which is a tensile 320 pounds. Normal stress is determined by this equation with A being the cross-sectional area of this circle here, determined by this equation pi r squared. Substitute it in, we can determine the normal stress caused by the normal force, and it is the same everywhere on this cross-section. Next, we work on this torsional moment. Shear stress caused by the torsional moment is calculated by the torsion formula. J here is the polar moment of inertia about the y-axis, determined by this equation. Substitute in. Don't forget the torsion is here given by in the unit of pound foot, and that needs to be converted into the unit of pound inch to be consistent. Therefore, since point C is at the edge, here the shear stress is maximum, and it is 57.3 KSI. And we mark it here. The direction can be determined by the direction of this torsional moment, which is clockwise. Therefore, at point C, the shear stress is pointing vertical up. Next, we work on the bending moment about the x-axis. If you recall, the normal stress distribution caused by this bending moment follows a linear distribution and is zero at the x-axis. And since point C is on this x-axis, therefore, the stress caused by this bending moment at point C is zero. Next, for this bending moment about the z-axis, here, point C is at the edge that is the furthest away from the z-axis. Therefore, at point C, the bending stress is maximum, determined by this equation. Iz is the moment of inertia about the z-axis, and since the cross-section is circular, 
I, Z, and I, X are the same, both de determined by this equation. Substitute in. Don't forget again to convert the 1,240 pound foot into the unit of pound inch. And we can determine sigma max. We mark it on this element. We can determine the direction of this normal stress from the direction of this bending moment. And we can tell that it is a compressive normal stress of 296 KSI. Next, we look at the shear force along the x direction, the 200 pound force. Again, if you still remember the distribution caused by shear forces, then you will notice that at point C, the shear stress caused by this shear force is zero. Next, for this shear force, 240 pounds along the negative z direction, because point C is along the centroidal x-axis, therefore, at point C, the shear stress caused by this shear force is maximum, determined by this equation. Qx is determined by this shadowed area above the x-axis. And for this semicircle, this distance right here is given by this formula, 4r over 3 pi, and that is very useful, because Qx equals to the area of this semicircle multiplied by this distance of the centroidal location of the semicircle and the x-axis, which is the centroidal location of this entire cross-sectional area. And we can determine that, substitute in, and calculate the maximum shear stress. And we can determine the direction to be vertical down. Now we have determined the stresses at point C as caused by the different internal reactions. Now we need to combine them and present the result. We add the normal stresses together and we add the shear stresses together. Notice that the two normal stress components are of opposite direction and the two shear stress components are of opposite directions as well. And then we can represent the result on the volume element. Again, don't forget the normal stress must be in equilibrium and the shear stress has the complementary property. And notice that these six stress components on this volume element are all planar. Therefore, we can reduce this general state of stress into the planar state of stress. And that completes this problem.